Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session today, a conversation with Professor Jane Fisher. This session is coming live to you wherever you may be as part of the Bayside Seniors Festival for October. But before we commence today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which each of us joins today. For me, that is the Bunurong people and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So my name is Paula Clancy and I'm the Community Resilient and Safety Coordinator at Bayside City Council. We are very pleased and excited to have with us today, Jane Fisher, AO, Finkel Professor of Global and Women's Health at Monash University. Also, Jane is a regular presenter on the ABC <clears throat> and has a feature called Love and Other Catastrophes. Jane will share with us some of her more recent research that she has been involved in and draw on her learnings and insights in how we as individuals and community can find the silver linings as we journey through the COVID-19 roadmap. So we will be, this will be a very much an interactive session today with you all. So please use the Q&A function um, as much as you like, and please post your questions and comments. And, and that's what we'll refer to today. The session will also be recorded for those that weren't able to make it today. So please join me in welcoming Jane Fisher. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Paula, for such a warm welcome. And I was just delighted to receive this invitation from Bayside City Council for such an important and uh, innovative way of having a conversation uh, across a, a, a divide between the university and uh, people in the community. So I'm very pleased to have this opportunity. What I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, before we begin our conversation is some of the things that we've learned through our research recently to try and understand what the psychological consequences of the COVID-19 restrictions have been and what the implications are of these for our planning towards uh, a future in which we will be having to continue to consider the pandemic and its implications for all our lives. So that we know that we all had to make major adjustments to our lives to accommodate the essential restrictions to prevent spread of the virus. And these have consequences for our psychological well-being, our mental health, but of course they also interact with our circumstances. And at the beginning of the pandemic, the beginning of the period when we had restrictions imposed most severely in April, there were no Australian data that could be turned to for policy related guidance or for individuals to consider what might the implications be. So we, um, with the research group I work with, decided to initiate a short survey that could be filled in by any adult in Australia over the age of 18. And we really wanted to understand how common experiences of low mood and pretty intense worry or anxiety were, how severely distressed some people might be feeling. But we also wanted to ascertain experiences of optimism and hopefulness. And then we wanted to know what were the experiences between the, the links between actually an experience of COVID-19, either having it yourself or being tested for it, or knowing someone who'd been infected with the virus. Things like having lost a job or what your living circumstances were and uh, your mental health and well-being at this time. So the survey I'm going to be talking to you about today was open between the beginning of April and the beginning of May, which was the first month of stage two restrictions in Australia. And it was open to all Australian residents over the age of 18. And it included some standardised questions about these experiences. We were struck by people's generosity, including perhaps some of you who completed this survey. Nearly 14,000 people completed and returned uh, a survey in this month. And there were people from all states and territories, 
women, men, <coughs> excuse me, people who don't identify as either male or female. And they crossed the age span from 18 to 91 years of age and represented all socioeconomic positions in the country. What we found was that the sample of people who responded more or less represented the Australian population. There were fewer people who don't speak English as a first language, <coughs> and, uh, but in other ways they represented the population. More than one in 10 had lost a job as a result of COVID. And many told us that the restrictions were having a highly adverse impact on their lives. Because the whole country was affected, we couldn't find a population of people to compare our data to who hadn't had this experience. So what we had to turn to was previous surveys done in Australian populations using similar measures. And what these tell us is that in a non-COVID usual time, between 4% and 10% of the population are experiencing pretty serious symptoms of low mood or depressed mood uh, or anxiety or worry. But what we found was that in this first month of restrictions, the rates were about three to five times higher. So nearly 30% of people told us that they had clinically significant symptoms of low mood and about one in five that they had such serious anxiety, it was really interfering with daily life. At its worst, 14% of people told us that they were having thoughts that they would be better off dead rather than living with these circumstances. And a high proportion, more than half, said they were experiencing being more irritable, more easily annoyed than they usually were. And so these uh, rates were very much higher than is observed at a non-COVID time. But I think also of concern was that another, about 25% of people said they had mild symptoms. So these weren't enough to interfere with daily life, but were a worsening in their usual state in relation to feeling anxious, worried, irritable, and at times experiencing some significant pessimism about uh, their daily circumstances. Overall, more people, though, were optimistic about the future uh, than, than were pessimistic. When we combined these, we found that uh, there was a worse mood among people who'd had a direct experience of COVID-19 or who'd lost a job or who were very worried about their vulnerability con to contracting the virus. But the biggest contributor to low mood, to anxiety, to serious thoughts of self-harm or being better off dead were that the restrictions had had a highly adverse effect on daily life. And uh, these were up to three times higher among people who'd experienced uh, the restrictions as being so destructive of their well-being. If we look at differences at a broad level, these problems were more apparent among women than among men. So women were significantly more likely to tell us that they had low mood, they were very worried, they were more irritable and that they were using alcohol more than usual. And uh, these uh, really were indicators to us of who is carrying the highest burden in the community. And the reasons that uh, were associated with women having these experiences were if they were carrying a very high unpaid load of caring either for young children or other dependent relatives. And this could be a, a family member with a disability or an older family member requiring a constant care. Women were also more frightened of contracting the virus and more women than men were experiencing the restrictions as having a very adverse effect on daily life. So as we put this together and tried to make sense of it, it suggested to us that there'd been a whole of population shift in well-being 
as a result of the restrictions associated with the virus with both increases in both mild and more severe uh, experiences of psychological distress. And the most vulnerable people were people who had lost jobs, who lived alone, who were in the least well-resourced areas, were providing care to dependent family members and young children, were women and interestingly were young. And I think one of the notable findings of this was that there was a lower uh, prevalence of all these problems among people who were aged over 70 compared to those who were younger. And in making sense of this, we think that this is evidence of the maturity that's been accrued across uh, a longer lifetime with older people knowing that life ebbs and flows, that difficult experiences can last a long time but usually pass, and that there are ways of uh, surviving or living with adverse circumstances uh, that uh, perhaps younger people have not yet had enough life experience to have um, acquired that wisdom. These problems are of significant public concern though because people with these mental health problems function less efficiently. They have less drive, less creativity, lower capacity to plan and organize and less capacity to concentrate and to engage with others. But these are all qualities that are needed if we're going to recover well and function well as a society into the future. So they are of significant public concern. What I think is important, what I hope to be uh, able to engage in a discussion with you about is I don't think it's helpful to bring a psychiatric framework to understanding these problems. Some of them are undoubtedly severe and will benefit from individualised forms of care. But I think it's better for us to conceptualise these as a normal human response to a very abnormal circumstance. And that this circumstance has challenged us all. It's challenged our individual capacities to adapt to change, to adapt to unwelcome uncertainty. But it's very much altered our capacity to interact closely with others and our opportunities to engage in purposeful and meaningful activities that are very much at the heart of having life satisfaction. We know that anxiety is usually increased in circumstances of uncertainty, especially when there's some degree of risk that's uh, pervasive and uncertain, and where there's uh, no end point that is obvious that we can know that by a certain time it will be over. What the social theories of depression tell us is that we're most likely to experience low mood in circumstances where we feel trapped and humiliated. And I think it's not difficult to imagine that someone who, that we all felt confined and we were confined, but how much worse that is if the confinement is accompanied by loss of job, loss of connection, things that can make people feel less valued and worthwhile. So I think a wider conceptual framework is important. And there are a couple of ideas that I think are useful as ways of understanding this. One is the notion of what's called disenfranchised grief. We know that when we're bereaved, there is an obvious event that has occurred and there's usually some public acknowledgement of that others recognize it and there can be ceremonies or rituals that accompany that loss. Disenfranchised grief is the term to describe experiences of loss for which there's no public recognition and no rituals. So if a person has lost a job or lost a capacity to have regular connection with others or if they've lost the services that assist them with their daily work of caring for dependent family members or young children, or they've lost access to 
really prized and precious relationships and opportunities, then these are significant experiences of loss, but they're not visible. They're not easily recognised or named. But disenfranchised grief leads to the same psychological states of sadness, yearning, mourning, disbelief, and uh, that these can be really very disabling of daily experience. The other construct that I think is a useful one for us to think about is demoralisation. And demoralisation has been described most when people are in situations where they have a severe and intractable illness. But I think it also describes very well the feelings that can develop in us when we feel powerless to affect change. And that has been a very widespread experience in the last six months when there are things we would like to do, we would like to be able to act on, we would like to have autonomy to influence that we're unable to do. And that these experiences, I think, contribute to a sense of being dispirited, defeated, uh, really not knowing what might be the way ahead. But it's also very important to reflect on the opportunities that this experience has provided. And there's no doubt that probably for each of us in some way, and for some people to a very large extent, this much quieter way of living, more restricted way of living, has indeed had silver linings. People talk about enjoying the sense of being less hurried, less fraught, not having to engage in commuting, the constant hurry of managing an office or external life. The, the uh, blessing of being able to spend more time on domestic and private pursuits, perhaps even of being more reflective, more appreciative of what life uh, can offer. So these are the things that I would very much welcome an opportunity to talk with you about. As Paula said when she was introducing me, I've had the privilege for the last nine years of being a guest on ABC Melbourne on the Drive program with Raphael Epstein on a Monday afternoon. And we call the program Life and Other Catastrophes. And it never, continue, it never uh, stops surprising me that almost any topic that is suggested that we talk about touches someone in the listening audience. And so it's become an opportunity where topics of wide public interest are discussed and where members of the listening community ring in to talk about their experiences or to uh, engage in some form of discussion. And then what we hear a lot of afterwards is that others were so pleased to hear about that experience and it had resonated with them or it had had some meaning for them. And so what we hoped was that we could move now to some questions and discussion with the many of you who have generously joined this uh, session about what your experiences have been, both silver linings and difficult experiences, what solutions you've come up with, what ideas you have to suggest to others and to the wider community, as we all begin to plan our way forward uh, beyond the immediate COVID restrictions. So I look forward to having a conversation with you. Wonderful. Thank you for that, um, <clears throat> Jane. And um, such telling data, um, you know, as you've sort of highlighted, such a whole of population shift in wellbeing has occurred. Um, so, so really, thank you for sharing those those insights. Um, with the research itself, was that able to be accessed um, by people? It, look, it, it certainly is. As some of you will be familiar with the vagaries of having research data published, but I am pleased to be able to tell you that the Medical Journal of Australia will be publishing these data. They keep assuring us it will be next week, next week, but I think it will be soon. And it is available on the MJA website as what's called a preprint. So if you go to the MJA website, 
and put in my surname, then a preprint of the paper is available as a PDF document and the proper published paper will be available, we hope, very soon uh, mm. through the Medical Journal of Australia. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Jane. And um, as we were speaking, we've got a number of questions coming through, which is wonderful. So, um, so we've got uh, some of some members of my family have increased their alcohol intake, and I am a little concerned that this has become a coping me mechanism for for them. Um, sort of any mm. advice mm. Um, or thoughts around this issue? Mm. Well, look, I think it's a very astute observation. And in fact, we asked in the survey, are you drinking more than usual, using alcohol more than usual? And about a third of people said they were using alcohol more than usual. And I think what struck us is that this was very closely aligned with people saying they were experiencing a lot of worry and low mood. So it does seem that it's being used as a self-soothing, self-comforting mechanism. But that doesn't mean that the hazards of alcohol use disappear and the hazards, of course, are for your own health. But I think one of the other hazards that has been discussed in the paper is that it can lead people to lose their temper more readily. And we have been hearing about you know, more problems with family arguments, family violence, and we know that alcohol can contribute to these. The other thing we know is that if people are out socially and drinking alcohol socially outside, they tend to drink a little less than they do at home. So the, the, the constraints on having that extra glass, the extra drink are lower outside than they are at home. So I think um, it's good that you're uh, observing this among your family members. It's one of the very difficult topics to raise. So it might be that you could use this talk to say to them that you heard that this was a problem for many people in Victoria and is it a problem for them? Because it is a difficult thing, I think, to comment on people's use of alcohol when it seems to be excessive. But it is really important to remember the safe drinking guidelines, which really tell us we should not be using alcohol every day and we should be using it in quite modest amounts. Mm. Thank you, Jane. Um, another question here has come from one of our participants. I, um, I did the free Zoom training through council, which has enabled me to attend this session, which is fantastic. Um, I encourage anyone listening to take up the opportunities to do technology training, um, whether through the local council libraries, U3A, or through family and friends. And they finished saying, learning how to go online has opened up a whole new world for me and I love it. Well, what a, what a mm. marvellous story to hear. And that is one of the things that has definitely emerged from this is that we have been able to maintain connections, productivity and links through what modern technology uh, makes available to us. But for all of us, we've had to step up, I think, into technologies we might not have been familiar with. So first of all, I'm delighted to hear that Bayside actually offers people opportunities to learn how to use these. But to, to become familiar with using Zoom, to be able to use it to link with, with friends and with the multitude of webinars, learning opportunities, I, I think is just a really purposeful activity to do. Mm. And certainly my book group, which is the Bayside book group, we've been meeting by Zoom. And I think it's it's been very important to maintain that connection. Mm. Fantastic. The um, Another question in here, Jane, says, the COVID pandemic has seen a decline in older people visiting their GPs and getting routine pathology tests. Um, my 80-year-old father is one of those people. How can I convince him that it is safe to attend me medical appointments? This is a very astute observation. And I think there's, there's widespread concern in the medical community that people are not getting the routine checks, the pathology testing, the regular testing. But also they might not be attending a hospital if they're experiencing uh, severe symptoms 
and it does seem that uh, it, that people are, are fearful of going to a clinic because they might contract the virus. I think this is a time now to be able to be very reassuring that there's zero likelihood, especially if you're wearing a mask, that, that uh, you will contract the virus and that maintaining these preventive health strategies is a really important investment in our own future health. And it's probably one where an offer of accompanying the person uh, driving them so they don't have to worry about parking and things is, is a really valuable thing to do. One of the things I am hearing about is that people are anxious about being de-skilled and that if they haven't used a car for several months, if they haven't practiced using an ATM, et cetera, that they're feeling uncertain about going out into the world. And it is a time, I think, when it can be very useful to offer to accompany someone to those sorts of visits. But I completely agree with you that uh, encouraging your family member to, to have the health check is really important and worthwhile. Mm, incredibly important. So there's a comment that has come through as well. I am doing exercise classes via Zoom through my local U3A. Whilst it is not the same as face-to-face -face classes, it is a lot of fun and I still get to see some of my lovely friends' faces. Well, what, a, what a great example of a, of a creative adaptation to, to this situation. And uh, I think it's terrific to have actually taken the opportunities up. We can often be very aware that there are Pilates classes and one-on-one -on -one training and all of those things that it can be difficult to do, but to hear that this has continued and it has the, the social benefit of connecting you with friends is, is really such a good example and that it hasn't proved to be too difficult to do. I think that's a, a really great experience to hear about. Mm, absolutely. So um, the other comment and question we have here is we are... We are very blessed to have uh, kept our jobs and have been able to work from home with no children to homeschool. So in the big picture, we have had it easy. My husband has just started back working from his workplace and he is struggling. He reports feeling tired and losing motivation, but feels bad complaining because we are in such a privileged position. Mm. How can I help him sort of get through and work through this? Mm. Mm. What, what, what a thoughtful uh, question. And I would agree, those of us who've not had to homeschool, who have somewhere to live, who live in quite well-resourced neighbourhoods and who've kept our jobs are in an incredibly privileged position. I think there is a lot of uncertainty about how we will be able to resume office-based work or workplace-based work. And uh, this person's husband is essentially a pioneer because a lot of people have not yet uh, done, taken that step. And some of the things that we're hearing about that people are saying they find difficult are they go into a much emptier workspace. Mm. Some of the things that we used to do, which are gratifying work, like having lunch together are now prohibited. You're not allowed to do that, that even group, based activities have to be done in a distant way, can't be done in the same way. I, I think one of the helpful things to do is to uh, encourage people to initiate what they can do. So uh, it might not be possible to eat lunch together, but there are other ways of uh, connecting with colleagues and keeping them included. And I think I think what we have to hold in mind is that as this becomes the norm again, it, it is likely that people's interest and vigour will be retouched. On the other hand, quite a lot of people are saying, I've reviewed my life and I know I don't want to go back to that way. Mm. So while there is that time in the middle, it really is thinking about, well, how can I make change? What change is open to me? What change can I ask my workplace to begin to consider? 
So I think it is a time of great social flux or change and not surprising that there is quite a lot of uncertainty being experienced. But we usually feel better when we can grab a little bit of agency. So perhaps having a conversation with him about what he would like his future to look like in terms of combination of uh, work and private life and to see whether that can be planned towards. Mm. Wonderful. Some of my friends are extremely nervous about COVID-19 and are reluctant to catch up in person going forward. I am worried that connecting with friends in person will not be as it was before the pandemic and may leave me more isolated. Well, I think it's a very good question. Mm. And, and it is one that uh, has been, I think, an unanticipated consequence of COVID that we had this extraordinary paradox that we were told to maintain connection, but at the same time, we had to regard everyone around us as being potentially an agent of infection. So there was this extraordinary mix of having to be suspicious of everyone even when we wanted to be near them. So it really disrupted our accustomed way of interacting with others. And I think we are going to have to maintain a degree of caution, at least until we have a vaccine or until the, the virus really seems to have diminished, which at present is not the case. So I think it's important not to avoid the social connections. They remain as valuable as ever, mm -hmm. while accepting that they will be different. Having a close conversation through a mask is more difficult. Not being able to hug someone you would usually have hugged is more difficult. Mm -hmm. But the conversation is still worth having. The opportunity to connect, if you can, is well worth having. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I recognise what's being described, but I think it is something where we've really got to persist and re-engage again as well as we can. Mm. Yeah. Uh, one of our participants in the audience here, as interested, can you share some of the things you have done to help you get through the current restrictions and the environment? Well, uh, as I said before, I'm, I'm enormously privileged in that I have been able to continue my work. So uh, I, I'm a, a full-time academic. I work with a research group of um, interesting, committed people. Mm -hmm. And thanks to Zoom, we are able to maintain regular connection and purposeful activity. And while at times that feels too much, as though there's not a minute between uh, meetings and uh, deadlines, it, it has been, uh, for me, very valuable to be able to continue that, to be able to continue the radio program because there's, I have a special thing called a journalist's tie line that allows me to, to ring in to the program. I've missed being able to see my children very much and I'm not alone in that. I know that others uh, feel that very keenly. Um, and that is something where I find a, a Zoom conversation is good, but no substitute. So um, I'm also privileged that I don't live alone. And so uh, I have uh, very much benefited from uh, my husband's generosity and patience. He's retired, but he has continued to uh, manage our household and take good care of me. So all of those things have uh really benefited me and have I'm, I'm privileged to receive them. Uh, I do try and walk every day. I'm not a, a good exerciser, but I look forward to going back to the Pilates classes that I've uh, enjoyed. And I think that mix of things has uh, enabled me to continue to feel purposefully engaged and optimistic about the future. And I've really enjoyed my Zoom connections with friends when they're possible. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, another question here. Understand we have all been impacted. As an, uh, as an observer, <clears throat> observation, working in aged care, the impact of the lockdown on elderly single men who have had their social outlets closed, such as, you know, pubs and TAB, has been quite significant on their mental health. 
Look, I think this is a very, very accurate observation. I think uh, people living in residential aged care who've had to experience um, very extreme forms of lockdown where they've been prohibited from in-person visits. And I know these have eased now, but they've had long months when they couldn't have those. When even the um, activities within the aged care facility, the lifestyle activities have been shut. So people have been living in very isolated circumstances. I think this has had a profoundly adverse experience. And often uh, these are people who are not confident with technology and have not really been able to adapt to replacing in-person connections with uh, Zoom and other connections. And stereotypically, and I think this is what our correspondent is saying, uh, women are more able to maintain social connections and have more natural confidence and facility and men have often relied on their female partners to maintain that. But here, uh, elderly single men, I completely agree, have been left very vulnerable in this situation to extreme isolation. And I think they should be a priority uh, whose needs should really be addressed very directly um, as a matter of urgency, really, from now forward, so that their isolation, their sense of mystification, that's what's happened to them, the lack of engagement socially and uh, for, for other enjoyable activities is, is really um, a, a very urgent priority. So I'd endorse the observation of that question. Yeah. Um. So, Jane, how, how can we support our young people, especially grandchildren, navigate the uncertainty of the future? Well, again, a, a, a wonderful, thoughtful question. And uh, for young people, I think they have not had a prior experience of difficult adversity to call on, uh, to know that these are things that we learn from and we move through. So. I think one of the best things that a grandparent can do is to maintain a very active connection to encourage them that there are possibilities and that this has been an excellent possibility to acquire new skills, this opportunity to learn, even if it's not in an ideal environment and an online environment is not ideal, but there are ample learning opportunities and to take this opportunity to acquire skills that will be then available to them when jobs open up, when the future becomes a more optimistic one. But nothing replaces, I think, the value of initiating, reaching out to a young person and initiating a connection with them. And I, I think as grandparents, this is something of immense value that we can do. And also to reassure them that uh, as you move through life, there are periods where you feel lonely, isolated, as though what you want to have happen is not available to you. But if you can keep going through those times, uh, almost always, I think really always, they do resolve in some way and a new door opens. So one of the lessons I think we all have to learn is that um, disappointments are an unavoidable part of life, but they always represent a new opportunity. You sometimes just have to wait for that new opportunity to reveal itself. And a grandparent can provide a young person with that reassurance. Mm. Thank you, Jane. Very wise words there. Um, we have a, another question here. Do you think moving forward, business and government will continue to offer the opportunity to work remotely, given that a proportion of the working population have thrived working from home. And they also mentioned that it also has um, benefits, including environmental. Well, I think this is an absolutely um, vital topic for there to be strong public discussion about 
and advocacy about because I agree with the questioner that many people have found it beneficial to have uh, some of their work done from home and that many people would elect to combine office-based work and home-based work to the extent that that's possible. Clearly for some uh, industries, some professions, that's not possible. But I think that this is something where a collective voice has a great deal of power. And I'm hoping that many voices together will influence workplaces, governments, government policies, corporations, to really consider whether there are new ways of working and to acknowledge that productivity can be maintained and that uh, this is one thing we really should take forward as a collective silver lining, uh, which is that we can live and work in new ways. And as that uh, person also comments, there are amazing benefits from the environment in lower use of cars in roads being less congested and less uh, office, large office buildings being needed and lit and heated. So I'm hoping this will be a really strong public discussion and public advocacy point from here forward. Mm, wonderful. Uh, so we've got uh, a little bit more time just for maybe one or two more questions. Um, I'm, I am the president of a small local community group. Um, I am worried many of the senior members may not return when the community centres open and activities resume. Any ideas on what I can do? Well, uh, thank you for the work you do as president of a community group because these are really the bedrock of um, our society to have community groups who are building and maintaining links and relationships with people who live near each other. I think there is going to be an initial hurdle where there are some fears and uncertainties about risk of getting sick by re-engaging with faith-based communities, with uh, activities like men's sheds, with other community groups. But these are really going to be crucial to our recovery. So I think there's going to be a need for active reassurance, and it will be helped if we can given, be given this by government, that it is safe to re-engage. And how do we re-engage safely? Do we have to sit distantly? Do we have to wear masks? Must there be limits on how many people uh, can be there together? But that the benefits of doing it really outweigh the risks. And I think um, there's great power in individual stories. So to get some people to come back and then to get uh, those people to connect with others and say, look, it's fine and I enjoyed it and come back with me next week. Mm. Yeah, very good strategy, Jane. So um, I think we've come to, I think they're all the questions um, that, and thank you everyone in the audience there who did present those questions. It's, it's really, we really appreciate those for the conversation. Um, I'm just going to have a look. I think um, I think we will. Uh, if you've got any final words, Jane, before we finish up. Well, um, I I really uh, do appreciate very much this opportunity. I regret that we can't see each other. Uh, I thank you very much for your thoughtful interest and engagement with this. Uh, and I know that it is it is through being well informed about our own needs and the needs of others, that we're going to be able to recover a, a psychologically and socially healthy community in which people will continue to flourish. So thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, you're so welcome. Um, so we really would like to thank you, Jane, for your time today. You've been incredibly generous with your insights and, and your wisdom um, and also for sharing the latest research for us and making that available or, or, or showing us where that where we can access that as well. Because I do think um, some of the recommendations or suggestions that's come from that research can really assist um, individuals, but also, you know, organisations working in this area to support community going forward. will give them some insights and ideas about how they might plan for that recovery phase as well. So on behalf of our team at Bayside here and also the audience, 
Um, thank you so much for being with us thank today. You for having me. Thank you. And should people like to find out um, any more about the Bayside Seniors Festival that is coming up, we still do have a couple of weeks to go. Um, you can go to the Bayside City Council website um, and that will take you directly to all the programs that are still available. And also, should you want to follow up with any of the um, accessing any future pro uh, activities or programs coming up, you can email the Healthy Ageing team or contact us over the phone. So once again, thank you and have a lovely afternoon.